Of all requests I have ever put out into the ether, this has to be the one that has lost the most, yet has also always had the greatest fan pull. Everyone was saying we want the Hell Iceberg, we want the Hell Iceberg, we want the Hell Iceberg. Ask, persevere, and you shall receive. In the small chance that you've never seen an Iceberg video before, it's basically a tier list, a list of facts, with them going progressively darker as the video goes on. So at the start, things will be very common knowledge, things that you should know, and by the end, things are gonna be very obscure and very dark. So as we go down, things are gonna take a turn for the worse. I think it's important to say right now, out of the gate, that whilst this is a video about hell, it's not going to be a religious video, it's going to be as irreligious as possible. I have two rules, do not speak about politics and don't speak about religion on the internet and I think those are quite good to live by. Obviously with hell comes religion but I'm not really going to go there, I'm not going to put any real opinions in here, I'm not going to be discrediting or mocking any religion's interpretations of hell, nor will I ever really give any strong opinions one way or the other about it. So please do be civil in the comments, I just think that hell is a really, really interesting concept as is most religion, so let's talk about it, let's get into things. Up first we have my personal hell, which is getting critted and dying right before I'm going to beat the boss in a game of Raid Shadow Legends. That's right ladies and gentlemen, we have actually done it, it's a real rite of passage. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. If you somehow don't know what Raid Shadow Legends is, it is a mobile game which I just haven't been able to put down as of recent. I've been working my way through the campaign and my usual problem with games like this is that they tend to get a bit repetitive, but with Raid Shadow Legends I've actually found the opposite. The more into the game I'm guessing, the more invested I am. It has over 600 playable champions, each of them extremely unique which I love. You can really tailor your gameplay to what you want. But it's also got an insane variety of bosses as well. This right here is Malek Kavar. They've all got crazy names and even crazy designs. I mean look at that, that is just one of the many many bosses that you get to fight against. That's probably my favourite part of the game, it's the massive boss battles. Every time you win it literally feels like you've slayed a dragon, it's an amazing feeling. There's always a bunch of stuff happening in Raid. This very month, there's special events every day, a bunch of new champions, and the brand new Guardian Ring that gives you a load of new ways to use your champions. Even going on into December, it has a bunch of stuff. Like, what even is that behind there? Is that some sort of snake? I don't know, but it looks really awesome. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan the QR code right here and you'll get the epic hero Chinoru, 200,000 silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 ancient shard so you'll be massive head and shoulders above the competition as soon as you get in game. All of this really awesome loot is waiting for you here but it's only available for the next 30 days so if you've ever considered getting into raid now really is the time. It's really that easy just click the link download it and I hope to see you there. Thank you so much to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. On to our second entry now, it is that Satan is the leader and why yes, he is. Satan, or Lucifer if you're nasty, was once an angel. However, he was banished from heaven by God and now he rules the underworld. That though will be used for a later entry, but either way, Satan now rules the underworld and in the Bible it's kind of shown that him and God sometimes talk to each other, making bets on people and I speak about the Bible because I was raised Catholic so I know a little bit about the Bible I don't really know much about other holy books that is the biggest summary of Satan I can give right now but we will get into him a little bit further down the iceberg heaven it is the opposite of hell easy one here I mean I don't really know how much you want me to say for this if you are good in life you go to heaven if you're bad in life you go to hell and if you're medium you might go to limbo or purgatory and we will get into those two later as well there's a lot of stuff that we will be getting into as we go through the video before you ask though i had to confirm that i heard this through the grapevine yes in heaven they do have pizza fridays and yes they have a banging new year's party a pentagram is the shape of a five-sided star polygon and it was originally used symbolically in ancient greece and babylonia however has since really changed its meaning. These days we see the pentagram more as associated with Satanism and uh, the big man himself downstairs, Satan. A lot of people might use it to try and summon him. However, it's also seen elsewhere in society such as in Freemasonry, they use the pentagram as well over there. So I did want to talk about this because you might not know so much about the pentagram and there is something that I didn't know that apparently, according to Christians, this means something a bit different. Apparently, the reason why it's a five-sided shape is because Jesus was wounded 
wounded five times on the cross, twice in the hands, twice in the feet, and once more to make sure that he was dead. So I thought that was a fun little fact that I would bring up because that's something that I didn't know until doing the research on this. Bad people go to hell. I don't really know how specific I can be on this one. I mean, it's the bare essentials of hell. If you're bad, you go there. But I did want to talk about something that is quite interesting to me, and it's like morality and the thought of good and bad and how it can exist. Can a bad person ever be redeemed? Can you do something so bad that you eliminate any chance of going to heaven? If you're sincerely sorry, if you repent, and if you pray enough, does that do anything? How many of us are bad people? And also, culturally, morals are different. So whilst something might be illegal in one country, it's fine in another. Throughout time as well, things have changed so that while something was not okay in the past, it is okay now. Would heaven and hell, provided they did exist, would they change their standards to meet with modern times? Or would they always have one set of, this is what's happening, if you do this, you go here, if you do that, you go there. It's an interesting concept because morals and what's deemed as good and evil has changed throughout history. As well as that, it changes by geography too, so it really does depend. And just the concept of morality and good and evil, the grayness and the fine lines between them is something that really does interest me. What the hell? You know, this is a phrase that is typically associated with surprise or anger. It's a term of exclamation. So you might say, hey, Richard, why are you getting with Samantha? Or you might say, hey, Samantha, why are you cheating on me with that piece of shit Richard over there? I miss you, Samantha. I smell your jumper sometimes. If something happens that surprises or shocks us, in the English language we might say, what the hell, it's a term of shock or surprise or exclamation as I said before. Easy one there, let's move on. A demon is a supernatural being typically associated with evil. In ancient Near Eastern religions and in the Abrahamic traditions, including ancient and medieval Christian demonology, a demon is considered a harmful spiritual entity which may cause demonic possession, causing for an exorcism. I personally don't know a whole lot about demons, but I always thought it was interesting that you have demons and angels as kind of the pawns in the game of good versus evil. We will get into demons a little bit later on and specific ones and what they do who they're guarding what they represent but for now it's just a broad term for a demon we are only in the first tier after all satanists so i'm going to go out on a tier and say that there will be some satanists that watch this video and i really don't want to generalize about satanists always being evil or satanists being awesome badasses but i've come to the conclusion that no matter what i say people will get upset so let me just read the definition satanists are a group of people who base their ideological and philosophical beliefs on Satan, Lord of Darkness. To my knowledge, at least in Christianity, this is perhaps the worst thing you can do. This is like the worst sin that you can commit, turning your back on God. Because a lot of people that practice Satanism don't do it because they love Satan. It's to rebel against the constraints of religion. These Satanists are another strand of atheists, just they think that religion oppresses you and so they want to completely do a 180 and reject it. Instead, they tend to be a little bit more spiritual, focusing on things such as witchcraft. It's just hard to define because just as with religions, there's so many different strands and ways of doing things. Because while some people have completely turned their backs on gods and might want to worship Satan, other people are just quite extreme atheists and so it's kind of hard to lump them all together. The seven deadly sins, also known as the seven capital vices. These are the largest vices thought to corrupt people in Christian belief, even though they are never explicitly said in the Bible, these are actually made afterwards. The seven deadly sins are as followed, pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. I personally would be interested to know which of those do you break? Let me know down in the comments. I think I might break two from time to time. I'm not going to say which ones though. <laughs> the opposite of these are the seven heavenly virtues and we will get to those as we go down. Satan used to be an angel. I kind of covered that before, but yes, he turned his back on God. He tried to rebel against God and God sent him to hell where now he remains ruler to this day. I discussed it before and there isn't really too much more to say. They don't delve into Satan's background too, too much. They don't really get into the interdimensional clash of gods between God and Satan. All that we know is that there is good and therefore there has to be evil too. If you weren't listening earlier, just go back to my Satan entry and it'll kind of summarize it all. They don't really go too much into details, but yes, he used to be an angel. 
H-E double hockey sticks. So some households tend to be quite religious and these ones don't really like mentionings of damn or hell or taking the Lord's name in vain or anything like that. So you can't really say the word hell in those households. So what some kids do is they say H-E double hockey sticks because if you see the letter L, it's shaped like a hockey stick. So it's just a way to censor yourself and kind of say a word without really saying it. Just like saying fudge instead of or shoot instead of or instead of the grim reaper the grim reaper beckons i feel his icy grip around my throat so the grim reaper is the personification of death itself he might not be real himself but what he represents is very real and it will happen to you the reaper will beckon for us all one day one day he shall knock on your door later rather than sooner you would hope. He is a personified bloke that may or may not take you to hell depending on how you've lived your life. He's also Jamaican and lost a bet to two children in a game of limbo and is now forced to be their best friend slave forever. Onto the second layer of hell, information gets a little bit more niche or dark. So here we go, let's have at it. Hieronymus Bosch was a Dutch painter born in the 15th century and the reason why he's on this list is that he created this painting of his interpretation of hell. Many have before but this one happens to be one of the most famous depictions of all time. It's absolutely terrifying. Bosch also made a few more all to do with the afterlife but this one, this interpretation of hell right here is perhaps the most disturbing of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all of our woe. That was the first line of the next entry. Paradise Lost is an epic poem in blank verse by the 17th century English poet John Milton. The first version, published in 1667, consists of 10 books with over 10,000 lines of verse. Here's the thing though, this is a poem, but a blank verse poem doesn't rhyme. And this book itself is actually known as one of the most difficult books to read ever made. I have not had the time to read this 10,000 line epic book, so I can't say how good it is, apologies, but I do know it's incredibly difficult to read and it's about Christianity and religion and the rejection of God's laws. So Dante's Inferno, if I'm not mistaken, is the first part of Italian writer Dante Alighieri's 14th century epic poem, The Divine Comedy. The Inferno describes Dante's journey through hell guided by the ancient Roman poet Virgil. In the poem, hell is depicted as nine concentric circles of torment located within the earth. This is where we get the concept of the nine layers of hell. The divine comedy represents the journey of the soul toward God, with the inferno describing the recognition and the rejection of sin. Limbo is up next, and I really do think I've learned something of value here. So limbo, I just thought was another word for purgatory, but it's not exactly. This is actually the first layer of Dante's Inferno, just to take it back another one. But do let it be known that Dante's Inferno is fan fiction. It's not actually part of the Bible. There is no place saying there's nine circles of hell. It's literally just a guy writing a book in the 14th century that made that. Anyways, this is kind of dark, but Limbo is actually reserved for babies as far as I'm aware. So the thing is with babies, right, is that when you're a baby, you can't do anything good. You don't have the capacity to do it yet, but you've already sinned by being born. And this is an actual thing. The original sin is being born because to be human is to be flawed and to have the capacity for evil. But because you haven't actually done anything wrong yet, you can't go to hell because that wouldn't be fair. So some people say that you go to limbo. The only thing is that I don't actually think that the church is behind this idea of limbo. I think the Catholic church has tried to stray away as of recent from limbo, saying that deceased babies go to heaven. But to my knowledge, limbo is never actually mentioned in the Bible. I don't really think they talk about deceased babies in the Bible. So who is to say? How many sins does it take before you go to hell? After scouring the internet, there is no definitive answer, so you can stop holding your breath. If you committed 322 sins, you're not going to hell, or maybe you are, you just don't know yet. There is unfortunately no explicit number, so no one really knows. It could be one, it could be a thousand, it could be a million. Some people say that the bar has likely risen in recent years just based on how bad we are <laughs> as human beings. Other people say that the concept of this sin really isn't how we interpret it. Some guy says 67, so who can really say for sure? 
I know in Catholicism, if you have committed a sin, you can confess to it, and if you are truly, sincerely sorry, it will get struck from your record, I'm quite sure. I don't think God can use that one against you if you have apologised for it, and you are truly, sincerely repentful. Either way, there is no set number, so you just can't get bummed out about it. We don't know. For our next entry, this is also really interesting to me, because turns out the Seven Deadly Sins actually had two weird cousins that got absorbed into uh, the mess that we have now. So it used to be eight, I believe, and then they added one and took two away. Acedia and Vain Glory, these two used to be additional deadly sins. And envy used to not be a deadly sin at all, you used to be able to be envious. <laughs> Pope Gregory in the 6th century folded vainglory into pride and acedia into sloth, with the former meaning vanity and the latter meaning the apathy of one's position in the world, so don't be vain and strive for more. So earlier I think I claimed that Lucifer was another word for Satan, but this might not actually be so because you see in the Bible this is never explicitly said, this is actually just an the fan theory. Christians have thought that Lucifer is Satan. They never actually say Satan is Lucifer in the Bible. People have interpreted a message in a particular way to think that these two are the same. And again, I think I might have mentioned this before, but the idea is that Lucifer was the name of Satan when he was an angel, and only when he was dismissed from God did he become Satan. Next here now, the Devil's Trill Sonata. So this one is actually one of my favourites of the entire video. This is a beautiful piece of music, and the story that goes along with it is spectacular. So this is a beautiful piece of music composed by Gaspucci Tartini in 1799. A typical performance lasts for 15 minutes. And this story is quite interesting to me personally because it's said that Satan himself came to Tartini's friend Joseph Lelon in a dream and asked him to be Tartini's teacher. It's said that he was given a violin and played like an absolute virtuoso. So singularly beautiful and executed with such superior taste and precision was the devil's performance that the composer felt like his breath had been taken away. Some of our best music was made because of dreams and this one is no different. Definitely give it a listen because it's one of the most interesting musical experiences I have definitely ever had the pleasure to come across. The Ars Goetia, also known as the 72 Pillars, is a group comprised of 72 demons with exceptional powers. These 72 mini bosses of hell kind of have a ranking system with each more powerful than the last, starting with Count Adromalius at number 72 and ending with King Bael at number 1. A few of these demons are also linked to other religions and mythologies such as Greek, Celtic and Egyptian gods and monsters. The seven princes of hell, heaven and hell really like the number seven, don't they? These are otherwise known as the seven emperors of hell or the seven kings of hell. And this one is quite fun because each of these take a deadly sin that they kind of watch over. Each one represents a deadly sin. So we have Lucifer for pride. Remember that Lucifer rebelled against God supposedly. We also have Belphegor for sloth, Mammon for greed, Beelzebub for gluttony, Satan for wrath, Leviathan for wrath as well, and Asmodeus for lust. Don't drop the soap in front of him. There are also other princes of hells, quite high ranking commanders, but those are the seven top, the top dogs, the seven princes of hell. I've touched on Dante's Inferno before, but I do want to go back over it and talk more about the Nine Layers of Hell, or the Nine Circles of Hell, or whatever you want to call them, because they have several different names. So again, the Bible does not speak of this, this is just a fan theory. And it's said that depending on what you do, depending on the crime, you go to different layers within hell. So almost like a high security, low security prison system, if you're a very bad boy, you go to the bottom layer, and if you're maybe not so bad, you might go to the top with each getting more dangerous and deprived as we go down. So you do want to be at the top. Either way, let's get into things. So these are the nine layers of hell. At the top, number one, we have limbo. At number two is the floor for lust. At number three is gluttony. Number four is avarice and prodigality. Wrath and sullenness is number five. We have heresy at number six, violence at seven, fraud at eight, and on the ground floor, number nine, Watch Mojo's number one pick is treachery, so betraying God, such as Judas or Satan. Hell of a boss. 
I'm just going to lump this one in with the Has Been Hotel because I have touched on at least the Has Been Hotel in a previous video. These two though, they are two different sides of the same coin because they are created by the same person. They're created by Vivian Medrano and again, I've actually talked about them in previous videos. I believe it was the art controversy iceberg because there has been a few controversies surrounding the creation and all of it. I watched the pilot and I thought it was actually really good but there were a few controversies surrounding Vivian and the creation of the TV shows. I have a lot of artists in my Discord because of that video and if you're interested, especially if you're an artist, please do join my Discord, link in the description, that would be very cool. Either way, these shows are both set in hell and in hell of a boss. There are these characters and they want to run a startup in hell and in Has Been Hotel, things are more about overpopulation and trying to control it. The protagonist there opens up a hotel hoping that people would check out into heaven. Jahannam is what I believe to be Islamic hell. It is eternal torture by fire, very similar to Christianity's interpretation of hell and similar to the Bible again, punishment depends on what you did in life, how severely bad you were. And so the worst evildoers are tortured the most, and the people that did a bit bad are still tortured, but not as severely. I think it's worth saying that the Abrahamic religions uh, do have a lot that links them, small things, but things nonetheless. And say whilst Christianity has the nine circles of hell, Islam has the seven layers of hell. And so it's only the small little differences that might separate the two. The Dao, if I am pronouncing that correct, is the Chinese interpretation of hell. This is a Chinese religion, uh, their interpretation of hell. I've actually spoken about it before in a previous video. I do forget which one. It would have been three or four months back. I know I had face cam for it, but I do forget which one. And the Chinese interpretation of Satan, I think is very interesting actually, because it's just a normal looking bloke but he is the most evil man you'll ever see. The Dayu is Chinese hell. If you get the gist, flames, eternal torture forever, various layers of hell, depending on what you've done and how bad you've done it. You're tortured for the sins you committed in the overworld with each layer being worse than the last and you're tortured till you die and then you're revived and then you're tortured to death again. We've covered it before, but it is again, something to say that all of these religions do have very similar structures to how their afterlife works with good people going to heaven, bad people getting tortured, depending on what they've done. It's just something that fascinates me that we've all come out with these different interpretations of what hell might be and they are basically the exact same every single time. For Greek lovers of mythology, this one is for you. Hades is our next entry on the list. Hades is known to be the god of the dead and the ruler of the underworld. Famously, he is guarded by Cerberus, a badass three-headed dog. Hades is the oldest son of Cronus and Rhea, and he was eaten upon his birth. He, along with his brothers Zeus and Poseidon, overthrew Cronus and claimed rulership of the cosmos. Those Greeks had the most fascinating stories. I wish I had a time machine and I could just go back 2,500 years to speak to just a random Greek person and ask them to tell me their best story because they had stories by the bucket load. They had some amazing tales. The term Sheol is found in the Hebrew Bible and is used to describe where dead people go after they die. Whether or not they've lived a righteous life beforehand is irrelevant. Everyone goes to Sheol and waits for their judgment. The term for the section of Sheol, which was the place of the souls of the righteous until the resurrection, was paradise. Okay, it's a new day now, so let's get cracking on and uh, we're about halfway through, so let's get down to the more obscure and darker side of things. So here we go. I teased you with it before, but these are the seven heavenly virtues. We talked about the seven deadly sins before. If we have the seven deadly sins, why does it all have to be bad? Why can't we have the seven heavenly virtues? So these are seven things, that if you live by them, you're more likely to go to heaven. We have faith, hope, charity, fortitude, justice, temperance, and prudence. Those are the seven heavenly virtues. Have faith, have hope, be charitable, all the rest. These are said to counteract the seven deadly sins. Do keep in mind though that in no holy books have there ever been seven deadly sins. These are things that we have created. Either way, live by these seven heavenly virtues and the afterlife is yours for the taking. Hell is located at the center of earth. So we know that the earth is a big ball, unless you're a flat earther, and in the middle, that's where it's like the hottest. In the inner core, I think it's just all like lava, I guess, maybe, I don't know. And I believe this might be suggested within the Bible in Ephesians 4, 9 and Matthew 12, 
40. However, as with most holy books, the Bible is quite metaphorical, so you can't really tell too much. A lot of things are metaphors, a lot of things are sayings, but are not meant to be taken literally. To my knowledge, no holy books say that hell is here on earth, but you might say that perhaps there might not be a hell or a heaven, and therefore, hell is the bad times on earth that we have and heaven is the good times. That's what I think at least. If there is no creation, if there is no heaven and hell, then heaven has to be the best moments of your life and hell has to be the worst. That's all we have, the good and the bad. Jahina, if I am pronouncing that right, it is what I believe to be hell or purgatory on earth. Jahina was originally a valley west and south of Jerusalem where children were burned as sacrifices to the Ammonite god Moloch. Jehina later was made into a rubbish centre to discourage the reintroduction of such sacrifices. It's mentioned several times in the New Testament as a place where fire will destroy the wicked, and so I think that some people believe the passage to hell is there. Next tier, and things are beginning to heat up, as it were. Uh, these things are either very obscure or potentially quite dark. Hell is in Norway. This is actually bizarrely true, and you might know where I'm going to go with this. Uh, of course, hell is not on earth, but it is in Norway, literally. There is a place in Norway called hell. It's got a population of 1,600 people, and I'll say if this video gets like 20k likes, I'll go to hell, all right? I will go to hell, Norway. <laughs> yeah. Le fond, c'est les atteurs. This is a French phrase first said in Jean-Paul Sartre's satirical play, No Exit. The phrase directly translates to hell is other people. It's dubbed the slogan for introverts because of course it is hell is other people, social interactions and stuff. It just means that you don't like people, you don't like social interaction too much because it's, it's pressure, it's tough, it's all the rest. Satan's Waitin. This is a Looney Tunes cartoon from the 1950s and it is the 46th episode of the Sylvester the Cat cartoon and essentially Sylvester dies and then he goes to hell but turns out he's not lost all of his nine lives so the entire cartoon is them trying to kill Sylvester. He keeps on coming back because he's died but because he hasn't lost all of his lives yet he still has to go back to earth. I mean the premise itself is dark but the entire thing is classic Sylvester shenanigans with the devil trying to make Sylvester lose all of his nine lives, as I said before. Sylvester just wants to catch Tweety, but keeps on dying doing so. Easy, simple, let's get to the next one. God, the Devil and Bob was a sitcom that ran in the year 2000 for one season, getting cancelled after a mix of low ratings and also pressure from religious groups. I'm not going to say too much, but the premise of this show is actually quite similar to that of The Good Place, if you've seen that show. I think that in season three, or maybe it's season four, they need to prove that humans are good and therefore humanity is worth saving. You shouldn't just scrap humanity. The premise of this show is that God wants to start over again. He wants to scrap everything, but Satan's like, okay, actually, maybe not. So it's a weird twist where Satan's actually considered maybe the good guy because he wants to save the world. And so they have to make a bet on this guy on whether he's a good person or not. So it is quite an interesting one. Apparently the show got good reviews, but because the ratings were low and there was pressure from religious groups, it just wasn't worth the hassle to try and save. Next here now we have non-judgmental underworld. So not every underworld is hellfire and eternal torture until you die and then you revive, kill again. Some of them are just like, yeah, whatever, like we're, we're all bad. So those are the ones you want to go to. Those are the ones that like, you know, if this exists, we're sorted. It's tough for me to research this one because I keep on looking up unjudgmental underworld and movies keep on coming up. Like it keeps on coming up with underworld movies or TV shows. Uh, and if I'm looking up other stuff, it's just like highway to hell. So it's really not too bad, but some religions do have an afterlife that if you are bad, it's not the end of the world. You're not gonna get eternally tortured. Hell is an idea first born on an undigested apple dumpling. I ask you, dear viewer, what could this mean? Let me know your interpretation of this line down below. I'd quite like to hear it if you don't know the answer already. Hell is an idea first born an undigested apple dumpling. This quote is from Moby Dick, one of the most famous books of all time. And whilst there is no concrete answer for this, literature very often does not have concrete answers. You have to interpret what a writer said. 
we can, again, interpret what he said and think what this might mean. Online, it seems as though most people think that Herman Melville, the author, wrote this to poke fun at religious fundamentalism and the idea that there is a sin in being born in the first place, relating it back to the Adam and Eve eating of the apple. If any of you have watched this channel for a while now, you'll know that I like to talk about philosophy and just pondering ideas. I very rarely have answers, but I do like to question. And here is a little conundrum, it's called the problem of hell. So we know these four things about hell, right? Allegedly, it exists. It is the punishment of bad people who have sinned. Some people go there and there is no escape. You can't just jailbreak out of it. If all four of these things work in tandem, then some people come to the conclusion that God is not all good. He cannot be all just and all moral because if hell exists, God has to have at least a bit of a bad streak in him to send some people down there. Does anyone deserve eternal torture? It's not really for me to say. You have to make your own mind for that. Uh, some people have done very heinous things in, in the world but eternal torture, I mean, I, I, I couldn't tell you the answer. We are given free will by God and some people will use that free will to sin. Some people will use that free will to go out and commit crimes and commit heinous acts and then God will send you to hell. So are we responsible for our own free will? It's a bit of a tough question. If you're trying to blame God for the fact that you like ran over some goats or something on purpose because you thought it'd be fun. This does assume though that we're blameless for our faults because you can just go, oh, I've been given free will by God. Therefore, I can go out and murder people because I choose to. Free will doesn't absolve you from doing anything wrong just because you have it. So there is a lot to say for and against this and this is mainly pointing at Christianity and Islam because Judaism I don't believe has so much of a hell system going on there hell is a lot more relaxed and lenient compared to heaven and hell in Islam and Christianity. Moving down tiers once again we have the harrowing of hell and this is actually a very interesting concept so in Christianity this refers to the time where Jesus went down into hell and freed everyone. So everyone that died before the harrowing of hell has been taken up to heaven. If you were to go to hell, everyone there would be no more than 2000 years old. So hopefully he can do that again at some point because like, you know, we need that. <laughs> we need that now. Hell is really big. I'm sure it is. It has to fit us all in there. <laughs> I've spoken about this a few times because being raised Catholic and stuff, there is the concept of confession. If you confess your sins, you get uh, not a free pass, but if you're truly repentful you will be forgiven for them. This next one is the empty hell theory and this is either perhaps really good or maybe really bad depending on how you might see it. The empty hell theory is that after you die you will meet God and the only thing you need to do to get into heaven is ask for mercy and forgiveness. Fall on your knees, ask him for forgiveness and he will forgive you. The church has never come out and said that anyone specifically is in hell, so maybe no one is in there. They've never gone like, oh yeah, that guy, he definitely went down. <laughs> um, so this could be a good thing because it means that, you know, perhaps if you've lived a life that is morally grey, you won't go down to hell but at the same time it means that the worst people of all time might have also made it into heaven so you've got like eternal paradise and then just hitler's there and jack the ripper and stalin <laughs> the true definition of hell do you know what the true definition of hell is it is when you die and you meet the person you could have been how to visit hell. I don't know if this is meant to be taken literally or figuratively. Of course, in the real world, there's a lot of places they say that hell is. So like Japan or Iceland, they have massive craters that literally look like hell is there. If we're speaking literally, I don't really know because most people don't really visit. They tend to go there forever. So I could not give you an answer how to literally visit hell uh, unless you want to live an awful life and then go there forever. An eternal visit. The bad place. Wait a minute. This is the bad place. So the bad place is hell in the show, The Good Place. And it's not really hell as Christians or Muslims or Jews or any religion might say it is. It is a mishmash of everything. They do really well in the show to make sure that it's about religion and philosophy, but it's never specifically about one. It's meant to be a mishmash. It's that a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other. I would definitely recommend checking it out if you have not already. The Bad Place is just the interpretation of hell in uh, in this show. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good show. So I'd recommend watching The Good Place, even if it is just for The Bad Place. On to the deepest tier. This is the ninth circle of hell. The hellfire is hottest down here. 
hell is better than heaven. Some people think it is. Some people think that hell is badass. The idea is that the devil is actually just a chill guy. He's just a bit misunderstood. And if you were to go to heaven, you'd have to praise God all the time. So you'd have to like go to church every Sunday. <laughs> and uh, you couldn't say damn or, or God damn. There's a lot of stuff you couldn't do because God is very strict on that. You'd have to live the most law-abiding life ever. In hell, at least, you could say the Lord's name in vain. You could trim your beard if you wanted. You could practice witchcraft. So maybe there's not too many bad things down there. The hell iceberg brackets do not research. I don't actually know what this is meant to be, but it's a really good title. So I'm going to steal that. That's what this will be called. <laughs> cursed images. I mean, who doesn't like cursed images? These are all made straight fresh from hell. I think this one right here is my favorite cursed image, but there's so many of them. I love them all. <laughs> Give me a sec. I need to beat up my sound guy. Heck. That is what I'm trying to say. Similarly to H-E double hockey sticks, heck is just a word to refer to hell without actually saying the word itself. I don't know why it's so far down here. Maybe it's trying to be sarcastic or ironic or something. I don't really know. Uh, but yeah, that is The real hell was the friends we made along the way. I've just realized that this uh, down here is like the jokey part and then there's going to be something really, really fucked. <laughs> Uh, in a sec, so just do bear with me. I'm getting to all of these entries. So the real hell is the friends we made along the way. I mean, yeah, classic. That's like the end of story. It's like, oh yeah, you know, the real something was the friends we made along. Yeah, bullshit. <laughs> Moving on, proof of hell existing. This is unconfirmed. We don't know for certain. As I said earlier, I'm not picking a side whether I do or don't think hell exists. That's not really what this video is about. Theorized, but not confirmed. And I hope it stays that way because that does make it interesting, right? that it adds mystery, it adds a bit of intrigue, you know? So, I don't know. Dream is a demon that escaped out of hell. Is this about the Minecraft YouTuber? <laughs> That's the only explanation I have for that one. Dream is a demon that escaped out of hell. I, I, I don't know. All cats go to hell. Hell yeah, they do. Dogs rule, cats drool. Suck it, cats. Dogs for life. What's the next entry? All dogs go to hell. What the f Okay, so the last ones were jokes, but this one here is a real entry and I need to put a warning on it because knowledge of this entry is potentially really bad. Um, if you're extremely existential, I recommend like ending the video here or something, subscribe, join my Discord, Twitter, Patreon, uh, Instagram, and leave the video. But for those of you who want to stick it out, this is Rocco's Basilisk and you might have heard of it before. If you haven't, let me treat you with something really, really bad. This is a hypothetical, a thought experiment, and it goes like this, right? So say in the future, we develop AI, and this AI becomes extremely powerful, becomes singularity, it becomes better and bigger than the whole human race, and it's just one AI. The problem with this is because of self-preservation, this AI would have an incentive to destroy people that did not help it come into existence. Because this AI is so powerful, it could literally go into your mind and find the scariest thing, what you think is torture, the worst torture, what you think is the worst hell, and it could do it. It could simulate it within your mind, right? Strap you up into a machine and it will eternally torture you for absolutely ever. This would literally be hell in your own mind on earth. Because of this, some people might become afraid that this might happen to them. And so to get out of it, they would create this AI in the first place. This AI is going to be created because people are so afraid of what would happen if they don't create it, that they would. Therefore, it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. Fear of this thing existing is what brings this thing to existence. And here is the worst part. This is the real cherry on top of the cake. Because you now know of this, because I told you, if you know about Rocco's Basilisk and do nothing to help it exist, it will have enough on you, it will have enough to judge that you were not going to help it exist, and therefore now you are prime, you are able to be tortured forever. If you didn't know about this, they would not be able to torture you eternally, but now because you know, that is enough reason for you to be tortured forever because you know that this thing might exist and you haven't done anything to help it. Unless you do, in which case, 
we're all screwed. So <laughs> anyways, that's it from me. Thank you very, very much for watching this video. And if you enjoyed it, please do subscribe. For all of November, I will be donating £5 for every 1,000 subscribers we get to November. And for the rest of the year, I'll be donating £10 for every 1,000 subscribers to Team Seeds. So even if you might not want to watch all my content down the road, please do subscribe because it would be for a good cause. Aside from that, maybe give me a like. That'd be quite nice. I have a Twitter. I have an Instagram. I have a Discord. I have a Patreon. Follow me and join all of those if you want. It would be really cool. Thank you to my patrons so much. You guys are the best. I'll have a new story out this week. And thank you to Noidy for creating this iceberg. It's a great one, in fairness. This is a really good iceberg. Thank you so much. Big thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. It's, you know, it's fantastic. It's Raid. And finally, please let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next because I'm only 82 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.